So if you do not know this, it can be quite challenging. There are so many unwritten rules in Japan, like if you enter an office building and you have a wet umbrella then basically you can just turn around and go home you need to know the unwritten rules like where to sit and how to hold the business cards and where to put them and there's so many moving pieces that can uh, be of influence whether you have a great meeting or a meh meeting or maybe it's not gonna work out konnichiwa minasan Business Success Japan no podcast e yokoso. Hello everyone and welcome to the Business Success Japan podcast. This is your host, Lady Bigelman. This podcast is made for those who want to develop or strengthen the communication skills, cultural savvy, insights into current trends and conditions, and mindsets that are essential in a Japanese business environment. The helpful, practical suggestions and engaging insights offered here provide listeners with the in depth cultural context needed to achieve their own version of success while collaborating with their Japanese counterparts. In today's episode, I get to share the first half of my conversation with Nikki Van Ingenschnell. Nikki is a single mother and entrepreneur with one leg firmly planted in Amsterdam and one in Tokyo. Back in 2011, she moved with her then husband to Tokyo as a trailing wife. Unable to find a job and reach her objective to be at a native level in her Japanese ability two years in, she decided to start her own business called Tokyo Tours. Ten years later, and she's had a child, is divorced, and has her home base back in Amsterdam, where she runs her tour guide business together with a business partner in Tokyo. What started out as a simple side business has grown into a flourishing company with 50 local guides working for her from various destinations. She not only provides guided tours to tourists, but she also focuses on market exploration for the B2B market, where she helps companies take their first steps in the Japanese market. Be sure to stick around to learn more about her and her insights into life and business in Japan. Since we had a bit of a longer conversation, I decided to split our chat into two episodes. I'm always looking for ways to make sure this podcast is an easily accessible resource for all of my listeners, so please be sure to let me know what you think about this format. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on.、Uh, my name is Nikki van Ingen Schreenau. And I organize guided tours in Japan、uh, with local experts. So I have about 50 guides、uh, living and working all across Japan from the tip of the north in、uh, Hokkaido to the south in Okinawa and anything in between. Obviously, the guides I have predominantly live and work in Tokyo and Kyoto and Osaka, that、uh, area. But yeah, we have basically、uh, almost everywhere we have people where people go on holiday. Also, Hiroshima and Takayama, Shirakawa go. So,、uh, yeah, so that's what I do. And basically, in 2011, I was still living in the Netherlands, or I should say, 2010, I was married or living together. I wasn't married yet、uh, with a Japanese man, and、uh, he grew up、um, around here. And、um, at that point, he was like, How would you feel about living and working in Japan for a while? Because he never really lived in Japan as a Japanese person, and、uh, he was curious to see what that would be like. So I told him, Yeah, sure, see if you can find a job. I'll come with you. And、uh, I really didn't give it that much thought. And I just assumed, like, oh, you know, my English isn't bad. I have a bachelor's degree. I have a ton of experience. So it will be fine to find a job. And、uh, then when he did find a job and we were moving to Japan, and I did arrive there, and everywhere it was like, oh, so you're fluent in Japanese. And I was like,、er, not exactly. And、um, yeah, basically, then I decided I'll just study Japanese for a year or maybe longer, and then I'll be fluent and then I'll get a job. But then, two years in, I still wasn't fluent in Japanese, even though I was studying nine to five.、Uh, so, a friend of mine suggested, why don't you start doing guided tours? And at first, I was like, Mm, well, I don't know anything about that. I've never started my own company. I, I don't, have no experience with tourism. And、uh, she was like, Yeah, you should just go for it. And then I thought, Yeah, why the heck not? I should just、uh, do it and see what happens. And maybe no one will be interested. I mean, it can happen. 
but actually after one week i already got my first email like oh yeah i see you do guided tours i would like to book a tour with you so i literally just fell off my chair like oh my god someone wants me someone wants to do a tour with me and yeah i haven't looked back since except during covid obviously when the japan closed down which was really rough on both me personally and professionally so the business really suffered and uh, unfortunately not all of my guides were able to remain in japan but um yeah we, now that japan has opened up last october we're back at full speed we have 50 guides and uh, we're ready to conquer the world <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I actually just left Japan for a few months, but I hear that things are quite crazy right now over there for tourism. I'm glad I'm caught the cherry blossoms before I left, but didn't have to deal with all the crowds that seem to have descended. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Well, the weather wasn't great either. It was raining for most of the time, so it wasn't nice Hanami weather where you take out your mat and you sit underneath the cherry blossoms and have a drink and some food and chat with your friends. So unfortunately, there was not a lot of opportunity for that, but it was still nice. So. Yeah. Yeah. People will just have to come back to try again next year. Yes, exactly. Or come for the autumn leaves, which are also very nice. Definitely. So you said that you were kind of self-taught when it came to guided tours. How were you able to kind of teach yourself how to be a good tour guide in Japan? Uh, well, I mean, if I'm really honest, I may have told a fib here and there. <laughs> if someone had a question, I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, of course I know the answer. Or I tried to talk my way out of it. Oh, that is a very good question. Uh, it's such a long answer. I'll just email you after the tour and we just frantically look it up. and uh, Or... Yeah, I mean, sometimes people have a very niche interest and then I'll just say up ahead, like, you know, you probably know more about this subject than I do. And um, I don't think I can really go into a very detailed conversation with you because you are the expert here. But I can talk about various other subjects about Japan and Japanese culture and history and that kind of thing. Like once we had someone who had done a PhD on the war between Russia and uh, Japan, and I'm really not that knowledgeable about that era. I mean, up until the war with Korea, it's... It, kind of gets a bit fuzzy and of course second world war but other than that so my expertise is mainly before like meiji era and the edo era kamakura era so yeah i studied a lot i read a lot of books i listened to a lot of youtubers and watched a lot of movies so anything i could do to kind of get myself up to scratch i recently did a podcast on uh, yokai so that is basically the japanese demons and japanese uh, mythological creatures so i really had to go back and okay what are the details again who is out there and uh, what do they do and what what is their importance and that kind of thing so yeah especially if you don't do the tours daily then you get kind of in the rhythm and you know your story and it comes out fluently but as soon as you don't do it anymore it kind of sinks to the bottom and you just need to get it back to get going again but yeah it's it's fun i mean i love i love japan and all its idiosyncrasies and it's so different from many other cultures that uh, i like to do my research and talk to people uh, right now i'm i'm single as well so i always tell if I'm on a date, I tell people, do not activate guide mode because I will not shut up about Japan. So <laughs> and like, oh, interesting. Tell me something. Like, okay, well, you asked for it. <laughs> but yeah, you, I don't know if you can hear my cat, but he's very <laughs> disgruntled. Yeah, he's probably heard a lot about Japan too, if you've been practicing. Yeah. He's like, hey, mommy, shut up about it. It's about me. <laughs> exactly. So then having been a tour guide and then being a manager of a company with a bunch of tour guides in Japan. In your opinion, what makes somebody a good tour guide? Well, like we say in the Netherlands, you have to be a sheep with five legs. 
So basically, you need to be a unicorn. You need to do everything. You you need to speak Japanese at least to a certain extent, where you can ask for directions and read a menu and handle the day to day. Because oftentimes there are situations where the client will want to know more about something, so you need to ask or you need to be able to read something. So Japanese proficiency. I mean, you don't have to be like university level, but at least. It has to be well enough so you can manage. So that, first of all, you need to have an excellent sense of direction, obviously. Uh, preferably, uh, you're also good at speaking English or any other languages because most of our clients are from Europe. So any additional European language is definitely a bonus. And of course, you need to know at least the basics of Japanese history. And uh, you have to know a lot about Japanese culture, and of course, we pr- also provide a lot of training. So a lot of our standard tours, we take the guides the, uh, along and just have a session with all the newbies and uh, show them around and give them the script of what to say. But basically, what we try to do is uh, to customize each tour because every client is different and they're not interested in the same type of things. So I always advise my guides, just take like 10, 15 minutes at the beginning of the tour, explain what you're going to do that day, ask them, do you want to make any changes? Do you have any special requests? Do you like what we just went through? Because people don't read. So even though they might have booked the tour, it it's possible that they have actually no idea what they're going to do that day. And if it's at the end, then you cannot make any changes and then it's basically done and they'll be disappointed or whatever. So if you get that out of the way in the beginning to clearly state, okay, this is what you can expect. And then you can still make some changes when they're like, oh, actually I want more of this or I want more of that. Or I've had people like, oh, we would like to have sushi for lunch, but actually we don't like rice and we don't like raw fish. So we'll just eat some of the fried food they have there. I'm like, uh, I don't know what your idea is of sushi, but that's not how it works in Japan. So maybe we should go and look for something else. So um, yeah, you you really need to manage their expectations and yeah, build rapport quickly. So you have to be extroverted, outgoing, be able to talk freely without getting anxious and be able to problem solve easily because you never know things might suddenly be closed down or there's something going on that you did not anticipate. So if you panic easily, then uh, that might make things difficult. I mean, another thing I always say to my guides, never apologize because apologizing implies that you did something wrong. And most of the time it's you're apologizing for something that is outside of your control. So instead emphasize and say like I can understand that it's very disappointing I can understand that this is not what you were expecting I hear you but I'm going to come up with a solution I'm going to make the tour even better I'm going to add something unexpected uh, that we didn't have enough time for but now that this is out of the way now we can focus on that so it's going to be amazing So don't linger too much on the thing that went wrong, but instead try to steer them into another direction and uh, make sure that they're happy. That's basically it. Just uh, give your clients the impression that they're your friend and they didn't hire you as a contractor and then you can get away with murder, basically. Yeah, probably shouldn't though. (laughs) Yeah, maybe not. Maybe not. But I was just curious if having managed so many people for so long, does being a tour guide seem to be something that people can do over the long term? Or do people tend to maybe move on to something else or maybe even burn out after being a tour guide for a while? Well, burning out is not so much of an issue because our days are never the same. So every day you have a new client. So if you, for instance, work at a company and you can't stand your coworker or you can't stand your boss or whatever, you face them every day and you have to go the same route every day and every day you start and finish at the same time. So if you like that kind of regularity and that kind of structure in your life, then maybe a tour guide is not the best job for you. Because we are more 
are like free flowing, every day is different, every client is different. So you never know 100% what to expect. And if you like that part of the job, that easygoingness and that never knowing what to expect and uh, go with the flow and yeah, have a new experience every day, then this job is perfect for you. So burning out is usually not so much an issue. But the thing is, it is seasonal. So our season goes from March until November, December-ish. So yeah, up until October, November, we still have quite a lot of tours, but December is usually more quiet. And then January, February is uh, really quiet. So you need to be able to budgetize. And uh, when the going gets good in summer and spring or in autumn, even you need to save up so you can get through the lean months. So if you're able to do that, then you can just you don't need another side hustle. But if you have an expensive lifestyle, then maybe you do. Uh, So yeah, that is sometimes an issue where the guides are like, no, I want a nine to five or I want more stability or I need to know exactly what I'm going to be making every month. I want a steady income because yeah, one month might be amazing and then the next month will be a bit more disappointing, especially in winter In spring and summer is not so much an issue and autumn even. So yeah, that is usually why people leave or they're like, yeah, this is too limiting. I want to focus more on my career. Uh, I studied this, that and the other and I want to uh, do more in that kind of field. So we get a lot of students. We get a lot of people that just started their career or uh, have done a master's in Japanese or something or people who are like me, like trailing wife or trailing husband or married to a Japanese person and uh do not want the whole corporate Japanese nine to 10 <laughs> job. So uh, work from nine to six and then go out drinking with your coworkers and do the same thing over again the next day. So yeah, the free thinkers, the free flowers, they usually end up working for us. Yeah, that's great. So just going back to when you were kind of starting out your company, what was it like to initially start and then grow a company as a foreign woman in Japan. You mentioned you had studied Japanese, but maybe weren't quite at the level of fluency you were hoping for. Uh, Yes, exactly. So in the beginning with the whole setting up the company, that was difficult to kind of establish myself as a business and uh, do the taxes and the accountancy. And, you know, it's, that's the thing. If you become an entrepreneur, like, 20% of the time you're doing what you want to do, uh, your passions and everything. And 80% of the time you are just doing all the things you don't really want to do, like planning, uh, sending out invoices, doing admin, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's not all that glamorous, (laughs) to be honest. So yeah, you have to be up for that and uh, you have to make sure you get all your ducks in a row and you get the advice from people who are more knowledgeable than you in that regard. Fortunately, my husband was very supportive and uh, if necessary, he was able to translate uh, documents and that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, I mean, starting out, especially not knowing everything, but I mean, I feel as long as you are honest to your clients and just explain like, oh, I'm just starting out. Uh, I I might not know everything perfectly. So if I make a mistake, then it's because I'm still uh, learning how to do this. So I started out with a really low rate because I felt like my clients shouldn't suffer from the fact that I'm not this uh, expert or Japanese anything. Yeah, and able to grow my business uh, quickly because of the low rates. Many people flocked to me and with the word of mouth, got things going. I got the reviews and yeah. And then a few months in. So I started in March of 2013. And then in June, I received an email from a lady and uh, she said like, oh, I see you do guided tours. I did something similar in Amsterdam. Would you consider hiring me? And I thought, no, I always imagined myself as an independent contractor, but actually it would be nice to have a day off occasionally. So why not? And that's kind of how I started to grow the business organically. And then 
as soon as I started contacting the travel agents, like, oh, would you be consider? Uh, would you like to consider uh, selling our tours, our products? Then they were like, oh, but do you know some in Osaka and in Kyoto and here and there, and we need a guide there, and can you arrange that? And how about this? And then I started to kind of focus more on other things as well, not just Tokyo, but also other cities and also other type of clients. And I love a challenge. Um, that is what I live for. So uh, I don't like to do the same thing over and over again. So if there's a client that has like a really unique interest or hobby or something that they want to discover in Japan, I just love it. As long as I have enough time, I really like to delve deep and see what I can come up with and see what kind of unique experience I can offer them. So, um, yeah, I guess the fact that we are so flexible and so open to what the client wants that really helped us to propel the business forward. Yeah, definitely. It sounds like you were very good at just being open to opportunities that came your way and doing the work it takes to make it successful. So that's great. So is there anything you wish you had known ahead of time when you were first starting out running or expanding your business? Yeah, especially about Japanese work culture. Like in Japan, people are forced to do job rotation every three years. So the job rotation isn't necessarily something they want to do or have an interest in or are good at or are knowledgeable at. They can do something completely different from one day to the next. So then you have your contact person and then suddenly it becomes April and April is when uh, everything changes and the, the new year starts. And then you have another contact person who has absolutely no idea what he or she is doing. And you really need to take them by the hand and kind of be patient and explain everything. And also, you know, language wise, um, Dutch is a very low contact language and Japanese is a very high context language meaning that we we don't like to beat around the bush we don't like to yes and it's spring and the weather is nice and blah 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 okay let's get uh, let's get to the point we are straight away okay no agenda what's on the agenda let's go down all the points and let's talk money let's talk business whereas Japanese are like and the leaves are starting to fall and the, the crisp air is coming and la, 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 la. And then last line, it's like, oh, and by the way, and also Japanese people do not like to say no. So they prefer to just ignore you if that's something they feel uncomfortable doing. So if you are asking for a quote and there is, for whatever reason, they cannot deliver, then they'll just stop talking to you. <laughs> or as a foreigner and as a woman, there are quite some biases that people just do not want to work with you simply for the fact that you are non-Japanese or for the fact that you're a woman or the fact that you are both. <laughs> Uh, so if you do not know this, it can be quite challenging. So what the hell is going on? Why is this being so difficult? And why are you being so difficult? So it's really hard to get to the bottom of things sometimes. So yeah, these things would have been helpful if I learned that beforehand. And also, you know, there's so many unwritten rules in Japan. Like, for instance, if you enter an office building and you have a wet umbrella which is dripping on the floor then basically you can just turn around and go home because that can sometimes be enough for people to be like okay now this person is just so rude and so not up to our standards and clearly has no idea what we value in life so just leave already we don't want to discuss this with you so yeah you need to know the unwritten rules like where to sit and how to hold the business cards and where to put them and there's so many moving pieces that can uh, be of influence whether you have a great meeting or a meh meeting or maybe it's not gonna work out at all so and yeah the, i mean at the end of the meeting Japanese people tend to say, okay, yeah, 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 thank you. But you will rarely get a hard yes or a hard no. So you need to kind of read the air, read between the lines. So 
what is actually the outcome? Do you think they'll work with us or not? Or <laughs> let's see. So build on the relationship, try not to push too much, massage them, and then slowly, slowly, you might get the outcome that you have desired. And if not, then uh, maybe focus on another one. All very great bits of information to keep in mind as you get started in Japan, because as you said, it can be the details that really sour a relationship or maybe make a deal go bad. Sometimes you don't always know until you think about it in hindsight, like, oh, maybe I offended somebody this way. Maybe I didn't do this quite right. So the more you can be careful and pay attention, I think the better off you'll be in Japan. (laughs) And it's also funny that you mentioned high context versus low context, because I have been warned as an American that working with Dutch people, they tend to be even more low context than Americans. And yeah, yeah. So it doesn't matter the culture, the more you can be aware of kind of where they're ranked (laughs) in terms of that communication style can go a long way. Yeah, and we tend to be more risk takers, you know, the VOC mentality and let's get it done and let's conquer the world, whereas Japan is very risk averse. So if there's any ambiguity, the answer will probably be no. So you need to prepare yourself and get all the details out there. So if we give a presentation, we have just a few bullet points and just do like the broad picture, whereas Japan is like, no, we need to know in advance every single detail or the answer is going to be no. So yeah, totally different mindset. So then now that I assume you're still in the Netherlands? Uh, Yes, I'm in Amsterdam right now. I'm going to Japan in June again, and I'm going to stay for three months because since 2018, I've had a business partner and she is going to be in the Netherlands during the summer. So we need boots on the ground to handle all the local stuff. So I'm actually going to go to Japan and uh, also going to pick up a tour here or there because we are still trying to grow our Dutch uh, workforce. So unfortunately, if you are a Dutch speaker and you want to work in Japan, please let me know. We we would be glad to have you. Yeah, but uh, normally speaking, I can just run the business from here because most of our clients are here or in Europe in any case. So it's actually a benefit to be closer to the fire, so to speak. Uh, and then I have my partner normally in Japan who handles all the local stuff. So it's a it's a good mix. Yeah. So are there any challenges with running this company remotely? Is it something that you think you could do if you did not have that partner actually physically in Japan? Oh, yeah, for sure. If I didn't have her, still sometimes I'll get cold because I'm the main face of Tokyo Tour. So uh, this morning I had a phone call at 4 a.m. I cannot find a guide. And uh, you have all the information. There's an email address. There's a phone number. Can you please try that first? Yeah, but I don't know. I don't know. So, yeah, it's definitely easier if they can contact someone that is at the same in the same time zone and can arrange everything. But um, yeah, if I didn't have my partner, it would probably be very difficult to arrange from here. So would you mind sharing a little bit more about your experiences coping with culture shock and reverse culture shock, maybe initially and then as you go between the two countries? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, when I first came to Japan, prior to coming to Japan, So the first couple of months, I was listening to the audio files and they would say, okay, now we are going to say thank you in Japanese. The way to say thank you is arigato. Please repeat after me. And um, basically, they would just have this conversation play out and then you had to repeat everything and then they would ask questions. So how do you say, hello, my name is John. And then you would have to you had to try and say it and um, so they didn't explain any of the grammar or what it was you were actually saying so I learned that the correct response to someone asking hi how are you so hi how are you is uh, ogenki desu ka more formal way and then the correct response would be genki desu okagesama de And uh, basically, that means I'm well, thanks to you. And uh, so I started Japanese class and the 
the lady at the reception was, oh, genki desu ka? And I was like, genki desu, okagasama de. And she just starting laughing incessantly. I'm like, uh, did I say something wrong? Did I say something offensive? What just happened? Is it my pronunciation? And um, she was like, no, but the whole okagasama de thing is like really, really typical Japanese. And it's kind of... It's formal and not something you use in an everyday situation so it's so weird to see someone looking like you like blonde and and green eyes to say something so ubiquitous japanese so it's just really hysterical to see that so every time i walked past she was like oh come on come on you have to see this you have to see this do it do it do it again do it again that one thing yeah 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 go do it do it and i'd be like oh okay this is starting to get somewhat embarrassing but uh and I was like, yeah it's hysterical she's so funny like uh, okay but uh yeah and you know you would go to the um, supermarket and my husband would be like oh just pick up some rice and there would be like this whole aisle with like 500 different kinds of rice and i'd be like it's it kind of looks all the same to me i mean rice is rice right so i'd just grab a bag and go home and he'd be like what the hell did you just buy this is all wrong this is mochi rice i'm like it's rice, isn't it? Yeah, but we can't use it. And we're... Okay, well, then be more specific. <laughs> and, you know, with milk as well, there would be all these cartons and they're all white and they're all standing next to each other. And you'd be like, why can't they just put milk or a picture of a cow or something? Why does this have to be so difficult? So just grab one and it turns out to be like soy milk or juice or whatever, or even coffee from a carton. Like, okay, well, whatever. So just open it first and pour it in a glass to see what comes out and, and smell it. Like, uh, okay, maybe not. <laughs> And yeah, I mean, in Japan also, there's lots of stuff that's fermented. So, And, you know, slimy is also a texture in Japan, which was something I really had to get used to. You have like grated yam that is white and slimy and sticky. And you have the fermented soybeans and you have certain um, seaweed that are really slimy and sticky. So... In the beginning, I really had to get used to that texture. And they put raw egg over everything, through everything. And, uh, you know, veganism is not a thing in Japan, generally speaking. So if we have vegan clients, we have to know beforehand. Because oftentimes, even if it doesn't contain any meat or fish, then the base is going to have fish in it for sure. So unless you go to a vegan restaurant, chances are it's not going to be vegan. So, yeah, that kind of thing can be really challenging. And, you know, Japan is a country that eats a lot of rice and a lot of noodles. So people with uh, celiac disease, if you want to have dinner together, I'm like, oh, okay, I can't eat rice. I can't eat this. I can't eat that. And that's definitely challenging. Like, okay, salad for you it is. Enjoy. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, Japan can definitely be very challenging. And, of course, not many people speak English. A lot of the menus are handwritten. So even if you try to use the Google camera thing, you will not be able to translate. So I would suggest to learn the phrase, Nani ka o susume desu ka? which basically means, what would you recommend? <laughs> and just let the waiter uh, decide or try uh Omikase, so the um, sh it, the chef recommendation, that's usually a safe bet. Or try to write down like the stuff that you really cannot eat. Like, uh, oh, if I eat this, then uh, I'll hate it. So just write it down and just show it. Like, okay, I cannot eat these things. And they'll try to take it into consideration. But I mean, if you say, oh, I'm vegetarian, then they're like, okay, so you can eat chicken? So, yeah, that is definitely uh, still not really a thing in Japan. Yeah, any sort of dietary accommodations can be really challenging, especially the further away you get from Tokyo. Tokyo seems to be getting a little better recently. But another big one is just that they consider fish and meat to be completely different categories. So even if you say you don't eat meat, you might still end up with fish and vice versa. So a lot of things to be careful about. And I've heard good recommendations about 
finding those cards online with different dietary restrictions on them, that can be a good resource, especially if you actually have an allergy. But even if you're just averse to something, it could be helpful to list it as an allergy, even if you're not allergic. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I hope that you enjoyed today's conversation. Be sure to check out the links in the description of this episode to learn more about Nikki and her company, Tokyo Tours. And make sure that you're following the podcast so you don't miss the rest of our conversation. If you enjoyed today's episode, go ahead and share it with a friend, colleague, or connection on LinkedIn to help spread the perspectives and information shared in the podcast. And please remember to go ahead and subscribe or follow on whatever platform you use and leave a rating or review if you enjoy the podcast. If you'd like to support the podcast, please check out the link to the show's coffee page to keep me well caffeinated and making content. As always, feel free to email me at businesssuccessjapan at gmail.com if you have any other questions, comments, or suggestions for future episodes or interview topics. I'd love to hear from you directly, so if you'd like to leave a voice message, you can find a link to do that in the description as well. But for now, remember that the more you learn, the more confident you'll become as you explore all of the opportunities Japan has to offer you. Until next time, mata kondo.